All right, well, good morning, everyone. We're going to ask that you take your seats. And we're going to start, start with a very uh, a simple kickoff welcome. And I'd like to introduce the Napa High School Choir. Hello everyone. Oh, I guess uh... we are we are a vocal music workshop, and the first song we'll be singing is "Rather Be" by Clean Bandit. There is no place that I'd rather be than at the NVUSD 2021 to 2022 <laughs> State of the District Address. Thank you.
Hallelujah. 
All right, everyone, well, welcome. So um, welcome, everyone. Hello, my name is Dr. Rosana Musetti, your superintendent of schools. And we're here at the 2022 State of the District. And given that I just came up after the Napa High School Choir, I think we can end the event now. <laughs> They are evidence of our, the state of our district. How incredible were those children? They just move me every time. It's something about the choirs at our high schools that they make me want to cry. Just the, the, the beauty um, and, and the gifts that they give us with their talent. It's extraordinary. Um, so hello and welcome. Um, I'm so excited to be hosting today's State of the District event. With those of you that are in the room, but also just as a reminder, we're live streaming today, so we also have a virtual audience. It's been a while since we've all been together as a community, and I'm so glad for the opportunity to update you on the state of our district. As I look out in this beautiful room today, it just feels so good to see all of these faces. I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm grateful to connect, reconnect really with familiar faces but it's also exciting to see many new faces as well, especially since these last couple of years have robbed us all of many of our community-based traditions of gathering, like this one. Gathering is so important, especially when we're talking about the education of our children. And as an educator and administrator for almost 25 years, connecting with the community is one of the most enjoyable aspects of what I do. I've missed it, and it feels really great to be here today. Before we get started with today's formal presentation, I wanted to frame for you the purpose of coming together in this format today. I plan to take participants, both those of you in the room and virtually, on a journey. The journey has three parts, essentially. You'll hear about the important undertaking of stabilizing our district's budget. We will also look back on how we all survived the global pandemic, the infamous COVID-19, together as an educational system. And most importantly, I have the opportunity to today to share about how we are investing and strengthening our school district in order to build a better present and a better future for our amazing students at all of our schools. But first, I want to recognize that parents, employees, and community members in the Napa Valley Unified School District put a lot of faith and trust and confidence in me as the superintendent. So before we get started on sharing the details of that three-part journey, I thought it would be useful to be able to share just a little bit about where I come from and why I do the work that I do. Also, for those of you who don't know me as well, Given that we've been apart for a couple of years due to COVID, I thought it would be nice to reintroduce myself a bit. So this is a young six-year-old Rosanna. I loved school growing up. As the first person in my family to attend school in the United States, growing up in Los Angeles, as the daughter of two immigrants, school was full of lots of ups and downs. But one common theme in all of my schooling experience was that I was always up for challenges that came my way while navigating complex things like assimilation, language barriers, and what felt like two dramatically different worlds between home and school on some days. I also want to frame, frame this reintroduction of myself around the story behind my first name and the two women who raised me. In this photo, you see my mother, Rosa, as a little one too, alongside my grandmother, or in Spanish, uh, my abuela, Anastasia, who everyone called Ana for short. So you put together Rosa and Ana, and you get Rosana. That is how my name came to be. Out of all the things I could share personally today with such a large group in person and virtually, why would I choose to focus solely on Rosa, my mother, and Ana, my abuela? Well, I learned a lot from these two women. My mother left her native Cuba uh, alone at the age of 18, seeking opportunities for herself, not knowing anyone in this country. Rosa was a bit of an ambitious trailblazer. And even though my grandparents would have preferred that she stayed in Havana, my mother Rosa was fearless and determined in her pursuit for opportunity. 
I grew up hearing about how bold and brave she was as the first person in our family to come to a new country with no resources, all in the name of pursuing a better life and greater opportunity. My mother never attained an education in this country. She was too overwhelmed with figuring out how to raise a family while working multiple jobs. But she instilled in me as far back as I could remember that she, along with many others, had many hopes that I would be able to benefit from their sacrifices. When I was five, my abuela moved in with us. She also immigrated from Cuba and became my primary care caretaker while my parents worked long days from early in the morning to late in the evening. Despite her limited education, um, in fact, my abuela did not have a education past the first grade, she was one of the wisest and kindest people are, yeah, kindest people in my world. I'm so grateful that she helped raise me. She never learned English. She also never learned how to drive. But because of her challenge with acquiring English, I was actually blessed with a gift. I was blessed with the gift of being bilingual and biliterate as Spanish remained a primary language in my home because of her presence. And for that, I'm very grateful. So you could tell by the picture, this is circa 19, early 90 something, right? <laughs> Not only did these two women give me my name, but they instilled in me a sense of humility, a strong sense of drive, a commitment to always take advantage of any opportunities that are put in front of me, and a fearlessness that they modeled day in and day out. They made so much happen for our family with very little. They shaped my worldview, that anything is possible if you believe, if you act courageously, care about others, work really, really hard, and stand for what's right. Most importantly, time and time again, Rosa and Anna taught that little Rosana to never give up. So I rarely give up. I believe these characteristics shaped who I am today and fueled my passion for the importance of education for all. You see, in my personal experience, access to education not only changed my life's trajectory, but it changed the trajectory of my family, my entire family, and the lives of my own children, who are now 15 and 20, or actually, no, I forgot, 16 and soon to be 21. I had a 16th birthday on Monday, I, or my son did. I show up every day wanting to make sure that our school system serves that purpose for our students and their families. This is a picture of me with my father, Pascual, and my mother, Rosa, again, on that very special day in an immigrant family. The day I graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, forever a golden bear. Go Bears. Any bears in the house? There's got to be one. OK. <laughs> Go Bears. And I was that first generation college student on that day. And I, make, and I hope to make sure that NVUSD is creating these types of transformative opportunities for our students and families, no matter what their personal journeys may be. The drive and, and passion, this drive and passion serves a purpose in my professional day to day, but it's also helped me in the last couple of years, not only in my job, but also in my personal life as I battled cancer. The same energy I apply in fighting hard to improve our public schools is the same energy that helped me overcome a major health crisis during a global pandemic. Once again, I'm so grateful to this community, and I really mean this community, and their support. I'm going to try not cry. <laughs> While I navigated both health and professional demands simultaneously, you truly inspired me with your love, your care, and your compassion daily to survive a very difficult time. So I'm super happy to be standing here today, alive and well. I do not take moments like this for granted after facing cancer. So I assure you I'm feeling a deep, deep sense of gratitude as I share this moment in community with all of you. I tell you all of this before the State of the District um, because creating access to education is truly my calling and passion, and I want you to know that about me. And it will always be. It's been an honor the past four years to put this calling and passion to work in service to the NVUSD community 
as your superintendent of schools. So thank you for granting me that opportunity. It's been a tremendous honor, but it's also been a wild ride. <laughs> Navigating in declining enrollment, having to make tough financial decisions in response to that, operating schools, virtualizing them during a global pandemic, reopening them during a global can uh, pandemic, the list goes on and on. I can honestly say that we've been able to persevere and like reuniting today is evidence of that. We really have been able to persevere here in the Napa Valley Unified School District because of our staff. Our support staff, our leaders and teachers have dedicated so much of their own lives and time over the last couple of years to keep schools operating and students learning. It's hard to put into words the gratitude I also feel toward this team, the NVUSD professional team, the staff across the entire district. I am absolutely so proud of them. But of course, there's one more piece of the equation that has helped us succeed at NVUSD, despite the obstacles thrown our way over the course of the last couple years, and many of them are sitting in the room today, hopefully also watching us online, and that is you, our parents our families. Almost 18 months ago, in the fall of 2020, Napa Valley Unified School District was one of the first districts in the state of California to open classrooms TK-12 for in-person learning, while other school districts kept their doors closed. We led the way in the state and were recognized by the State Superintendent of Schools in California, Mr. Tony Thurman, I'm proud that we were able to take that initial step, be the proof point in the state of California, and feel good about our continued process here at the local level. Aww. Yay, a pause for everybody for sure. We were able to accomplish this, yes, because of our staff, but it was also because of the partnership with our parents. Pictured here, is our DLAC leadership team, our District English Learner Advisory Committee leadership team. Some of them I know are sitting here today. In fact, one of them is a rock star and she's translating and interpreting, interpreting for us today, Ms. Elba Gonzalez Marquez, so thank you. To all the parents, guardians, and family members out there, a big thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your support, your trust, your dedication, in helping our student, students persevere and keep learning despite everything that we faced. You are our most important partners, and we couldn't have done it without you. We all had to dig deep to maintain calm and normalcy to our lives, and especially to do so on behalf of our children, from the little ones all the way to the adolescents. It was a tough time. I also want to take a moment to just honor um, and recognize all of the hard work our parents do beyond just, you know, helping us navigate a pandemic. To all the parents, guardians, and family members out there who volunteer, who show up for our students' activities, and who support our teachers and staff in so many special ways, I know on behalf of all of the, the school site staff in the district, we want to thank you for your presence at our schools. Thank you for your support, trust, and dedication, always. So as I mentioned, uh, four years ago, I came on board, and there were some immediate needs and demands. I'm really not one for looking backwards. I tend to be really positive, stay, try to stay in the moment, and look forward and look ahead. But I do believe in learning and improving from past lessons. So remember, we're on a journey today. And it's important in that journey to realize that Doing work in service to children always requires a growth mindset. So I think it's important to just spend a few minutes of our time together today to ground ourselves in where we are today as a school district. So I want to start out by saying one day, I hope I never have to talk about declining enrollment again. Um, by now, most of you, um, if you've attended a meeting or read anything that comes out of my office, you've heard me discuss declining enrollment a great deal. But it does frame our current reality, so I need to dedicate a few moments to discuss it. The number one problem in school districts, like Napa Valley Unified School District, across California, 
is dealing with a massive enrollment, historic enrollment decline that already started years ago at, here in the Valley and is predicted to continue for the uh, foreseeable future. This chart shows the enrollment changes in California by region. The orange and yellow areas depict where declines are the greatest, mostly in largely populated areas such as the San Francisco Bay Area, which for the purposes of this data includes the Napa Valley. For the first time since the start of the century, California has fewer than 6 million students attending public schools. Many factors are contributing to this decline, including the decline of birth rates across the country, especially in the state of California, though, and families who are moving out of the state and the sheer increase in the cost of living, which is forcing families to consider relocating to more affordable areas, especially families with children who are just getting started. This somber reality forced us to make very pain, painful, necessary decisions um, over the last few years. And I had to lean into that as your new superintendent of schools back in 2018. As you can see by the graph, our enrollment, consistent with other districts in the state, has been dropping each year. And our projections show that by 2023, as close as 2023, the 2023 school year, we would have lost approximately a couple thousand students over the span of seven years. This is what has had to make difficult, difficult decisions like school closures necessary. We had to choose to operate less schools. We had to right size our district. Not an easy process. Not one I ever signed up for when I became an educator. We had to close schools that were too small to be financially viable while also implementing some reprogramming at sites that aligned with the district's instructional goals. I want to acknowledge that we have parents who've been directly impacted by this difficult work in the room today. I want to thank and honor our parents from River Middle School, Harvest Middle School, our most recent round of school closures that will be implemented next year, and also any parents who were affected by the first round of school closures at Yauntville Elementary in Mount George. Thank you for sticking with us through what I know has been very difficult, a very difficult time that has personally touched your lives. These have been very difficult decisions, tough decisions to make. In order to keep our finances stable, we understand the uncertainty that it's caused the community. Please know that every decision we make is a thoughtful one. And our intention is to always ensure the best education for all of our students across the district over the long term, especially in these unprecedented, difficult times battling that enrollment decline. If there's a silver lining in all of this, because there always is, it's that we were ahead of the curve as far as the rest of the state of California. Many other school districts in California today are just starting to deal uh, with the declining enrollment. And I'm getting calls from superintendents up and down the state about how did, you, how did the district survive it? How did you execute on that? How do we approach this work? So again, we have become a California proof point on how to deal with a dilemma and problem solve a dilemma impacting California public schools. It's been difficult, but we're clearly not alone. Most of our funding to connect it to declining enrollment is provided by the state according to something called the local control funding formula. And this is primarily based on the number of students that attend our schools in the district. So you see the direct correlation. Declining enrollment means declining revenues. That's why the reaction to it is so important. If not, you get yourself in all kinds of trouble. Lower enrollment means less money for our schools. And on top of that, unfortunately, California consistently funds education below even the national average, which is represented by the line that you see, despite our multi-billion dollar economy. I can tell you, you can see on the graph, we get approximately $10,800 per pupil in the funding model uh, for, for NVUSD, while other uh, states spend two and a half times that amount per student. So that's our reality, right? And that's the, the reality that we have to navigate on a day-to-day -day basis. We did have some financial benefit from the pandemic. 
Um, we have received here in California, thankfully, a lot of one-time funds from the state, from the governor's office, to offset uh, many of the COVID-19 losses and impacts. And right now, uh, Governor Newsom has also dedicated many specific funds to dedicated specific programs, like the summer school, uh, like the summer school program, our school meals program, um, and after school programs. We have taken full advantage of this one-time specialized funding, including again, free meals for students and an expanded, much more robust summer school set of offerings for kids K-12. And I'm excited to share more details about that in a moment. However, as great as one-time money has been for us, it's not sustainable. It's one time. And the reality is that the, there's no guarantee in the future, so we need to continue to be focused on smart financial stewardship in service to our children. My last financial update is on the subject of school facil facilities, which we've been assessing in details over the last year. And I was conflicted about putting this picture up there, let me tell you. Um, this is uh, a roof um, at Redwood Middle School. Um, and we had to respond to an emergency roof situation at Redwood Middle School. Um, part of the reality in California as well is that the state does not provide us a revenue stream to deal with large scale capital improvements for our schools. California superintendents, school boards, district leadership teams are supposed to figure that out at the local level. We've been very transparent about the state of our schools. The majority of our campuses, particularly here in the city of Napa, were built 50 to 60 years ago. And they have serious issues like the one you see here on the slide. They have leaky roofs, inadequate heating and uh, cooling systems, dilapidated portable classrooms. I know you've seen it as parents and staff. You live and breathe it every day. Outdated playgrounds and, outdoor, and outdated um, outdoor spaces. Thankfully, we have brought some solutions at the local level through Measure H, a local school bond. Measure H was approved almost six years ago, hard to believe, but it's been six years, and it has afforded us some real benefits to the district, and I came in um, amidst the implementation of Measure, Measure H. What did Measure H do for us? Well, it did take care of some critical seismic needs following the earthquake. It built four brand new schools, $269 million bond. It's a cost approximately 40 to $50 million to build a brand new school, and it built four, right? We have uh, the River Campus, which will be programmed as Unidos next year. We have Willow, Napa Junction, and Snow. It also helped us install a state-of-the-art central kitchen and school site kitchens at most of our elementary school sites to support our Healthy Meals program. It's uh, making school sites safer with fencing. Hopefully you saw fencing at many of our campuses. And what we have at every campus is a state-of-the-art uh, security system, vis-a-vis -vis our security um, cameras. We've been able to fix some of our oldest schools, like Donaldson Way, Bel Air, um, Alta Heights, Northwood, and uh, Napa Valley Language Academy is um, gonna get some modernization this summer where we've been able to repair those leaky roofs, install that HVAC, um, and also fix cracked walkways. Uh, the Measure H has done an extraordinary job in helping us advance technology at a time when we really needed it, right, during the pandemic. We installed state-of-the-art technology infrastructure across the district, along with the interactive boards that you see around the room here. One is in every classroom, despite school, despite program, there's, there's equitable access to that technology for every student. And we've also ensured that every student and staff member have a device. We are a one-to-one -one school district in terms of device and student ratio. However, despite all that Measure H accomplished, we still have more needs and no state funding to address them. The state of California, again, like I said, does not provide funding for capital improvement projects. And our budget is targeted for things like educational programs and employee salaries. Without the dollars to fix our schools, we'd be forced to trade off and spend money on maybe possibly fixing a roof versus funding a program or purchasing a specialized curriculum. 
Those are the kind of decisions and choices you don't necessarily want to have to make. You want to be able to do it all. This means local communities are left to fund facilities needs, which is typical, again, for school districts across the state of California. In California, school districts solve their facilities issues with local bonds. So we've been researching, analyzing, and getting feedback from our community about the possibility of a bond measure to continue our effort and ensuring that every student has access to warm, safe, and dry schools. We've been open about this and have been actively polling the community and have received some promising feedback. In fact, our recent poll from a couple months ago showed that 84% of the um, community in the city of Napa and 90% of the community in the city of American Canyon express that the quality of, uh, of education in our public schools is extremely important to them. So we need to help make the connection for residents, voters, that the quality of our facilities matter and impact the quality of that educational experience as well, where the magic of teaching and learning happens every day. The biggest takeaway we heard from our community is although there's a great benefit to having a united district, of course, and we will remain proud, Napa Valley Unified, our city of Napa and the city of American Canyon schools have very different needs when it comes to facilities. So if we pursued public support, I just want to take this moment to let everyone know that we're considering a new strategy when it comes to bonds. We're considering two bonds, one for the city of Napa to support the schools in Napa. The tax revenue generated by voters and residents in Napa could legally only go to do the capital improvements in the city of Napa and vice versa with the city of American Canyon, a specific bond in the city of American Canyon passed by the voters in American Canyon with the tax revenue generated by those voters and residents of American Canyon to be dedicated to um, maintain and repair our schools in the city of American Canyon, keeping bond dollars at the most local level. Two communities, different needs, but all part of our proud NVUSD. Um, as you can see from these photos, the need is there. Uh, we have very old schools needing attention. Both of these pictured here is Donaldson Way, the oldest school in the city of American Canyon, and Phillips, which were both built 50 to 60 years ago. There has not been a formal decision around this effort yet made by the school board. No pressure, school board, as you sit there. Uh, but in the next few weeks, um, I will be recommending to the school board that we consider this bond approach where we pursue two differentiated bonds. So now, going back to that journey, talking about building that better present and future for our kids. So what do all these tough decisions equal? Well, they do equal some district-wide savings, right? That's the whole reason for right-sizing the district and implementing tough, courageous decisions that aren't always totally popular. We get the capacity to be able to make investments for our children. The good news after all these couple years of difficult work, four years of hard, hard work, is that we have grown our reserves, which gets to that financial stabilization, and we've used the increased uh, money we have for academic and social emotional programs and resources for our kids. From a district-wide lens, we've been able to accomplish many things, so I'm excited to share them with you now. With the savings we've been able to invest across the district, we have started with, and I, I'm very candid about this as a superintendent of schools, employee compensation matters, right? The quality of our employees, from our teaching staff to our principals to our support staff, directly impacts the quality of the educational experience of our children, especially in today's market where there is a massive shortage in recruiting educators to come work in the educational system. So compensation must stay competitive. We've worked with our valued union leaders, and I look to them over there, um, from CSEA, NAPS, and NVA. They are incredible partners. Um, I could not do the work that I do here, and I know I speak on behalf of the full district leadership team, without the extraordinary collaboration that takes place in NVUSD between district management 
and our union leaders. So thank you for your partnership. Attracting the best and the brightest to teach, to serve as support staff, to lead our schools is so important. So like I said, our salaries need to remain competitive. And also, uh, providing professional development for all our staff is key. We need to make sure that we're keeping them trained in the best practices in educating our children. And in addition to salary increases in professional development, it's also important that we're able to invest in some fun too. In fact, this last week, we celebrated our employees. We honored them in many ways. I wanna thank the Human Resources Division for leading an incredible employee appreciation campaign during Employee Appreciation Week. We held contests and giveaways, and we celebrated work anniversaries, right? To, again, instill that sense of being an NVUSD family. What other district-wide progress have we, made? have we made? Well, I already mentioned technology, but I'm gonna reiterate some points and say a little bit more. We've ensured that front of classroom technology and those laptops during that student quarantine, which was so huge. I know we took it maybe for granted here, but there were districts that really struggled with technology during the pandemic and were unable to provide access to education because of the lack of technology. Thankfully, that was not our case. I'm also happy to report that we've been building technology capacity internally in our district. And I think we have a lot of staff in the room and even parents. If you rewind back to four years ago, the capacity of our technology department has really increased. I just learned yesterday at our uh, board facility and technology advisory committee that our technology department over the course of the last few months has report, repaired a thousand Chromebooks internally at no cost. Our technology department now has the capacity to repair devices and this demonstrates our commitment, again, to fiscal stewardship and responsibility by not having to purchase new Chromebooks when one breaks, returning repaired Chromebooks into circulation for our kids. That alone saved approximately $300,000 just by building our own internal capacity um, to address technology issues. Math. Parents in here, we care about math, right? I know my principals do too. So um, progress in mathematics, this has been an annual priority set by our board. And so we dedicated a lot of time um, this year to really thinking about how we could revamp our mathematics program. We've dedicated funding to improving transitional kindergarten through 12th grade math programs with the goal of greater achievement outcomes. We, this year we spent a lot of time building the infrastructure and hope to see the fruits of that labor in terms of student achievement outcomes over the course of the next couple, couple years. We've done things like provide uh, pro targeted professional development for our teachers in mathematics. We're working on those tricky transition years in math from fifth to sixth grade, you know, where sometimes kids fall through the uh, cracks, or not sometimes, truly often, and then also from the eighth to the ninth grade. Um, we're improving the way we do math intervention. That's been absent in the district, uh, both for elementary and secondary students. And I'm excited to say that we're looking, finally, at some secondary math curriculum for middle school and high school. So stay tuned there. Socio-emotional support. School is a critical space for students' learning and socio-emotional health. COVID-19, along with distance learning, reaffirmed that reality. On top of this, and I say this with a really heavy heart as an educational leader, our nation is dealing with a mental health crisis. There's not a day that goes by that that's not top of mind. Sadly, we're seeing a sharp increase across the country in reports of youth that are struggling with mental health, including depression, massive anxiety, and even suicide. As a district of more than 16,450 students, with all those students in our care, NVUSD has decided to respond by investing even more in health and wellness resources. We've put a lot of effort and resources this past year to integrate socio-emotional learning practices and curriculum across all the grade levels, as well as access to academic and behavioral interventions at the various levels. These are a few examples of what we've been able to impact at a district-wide level. And we focus more at every level of learning so that we're bridging 
I'm sorry, bringing age-appropriate program improvements to the classroom in this area. We increased support across all elementary, middle, high schools by adding staffing and establishing partnerships with a lot of organizations focused on me mental health. We added mental health counselors, social workers, interns, and school therapists. We've implemented a new universal mental health screener, an evidence-based behavioral screener that identifies students who may need intervention and support and at what level. This is really important. We conducted this confidential questionnaire with every student at every school site, which has helped us assess individual needs. We feel really good about doubling down on these efforts at this moment in time, and we, continue, we will continue to do so at each stage of learning in an age-appropriate way. These are just a few examples, again, of where we've had this impact at a district-wide level. So um, we're going to continue to take advantage of these savings and pour them into where we need them, right? Both at the district level, but also uh, at, state, at the respective stages of their, are your children's educational journey and the, the different grade levels. We've targeted each stage of learning so that we are bringing age-appropriate programs into the classroom. I'd like to now walk you through just a few highlights from the past year and provide a brief glimpse into what we will be focusing on for next year at elementary, middle, and high school. So let's start off with our elementary. So why don't you rise if you're here from an elementary school? Principals, parents, let's give an applause. to our elementary parents and leaders in the room. Thank you so much for being here. As you know, you're the experts. Uh, I am also for, uh, uh, elementary teacher, second and third grade, uh, former recovering elementary principal. A lot of respect for my elementary principals in the, in the room. Elementary is a time for foundational learning. We invested in programs to ensure that each elementary student is ready for the next grade level, both academically and socially. In addition to those expanded health professionals at this level, we focused on bringing more, again, socio-emotional learning into the classroom as part of the daily life for our youngest kiddos. Have any parents here learned uh, any of the toolbox tools? Yeah? Show me the breathing tool. Right? We have several programs already in place, but Toolbox seems to be a hit. Right, elementary principals? A lot of love for Toolbox. Toolbox consists of 12, this was a, a district-wide purchase for all of our elementary schools, and the Toolbox consists of 12 social and emotional tools for students to use when they encounter difficult situations. I would argue we should be using these with adults as well. Right, elementary? such as the breathing tool when it comes to calm, ourselves, calming ourselves down and checking in with ourselves and needing to focus on the next right thing. Or the garbage tool, I love the garbage tool, like let it go, throw it away. It's not that important when it's time again to let those things go and move on. Again, I have found many of these tools uh, very useful, I used a couple of them before this uh, presentation today to keep myself calm and focused. And um, let's consider like scaling that up with the adults, right? These are fundamental skills that we can learn alongside our elementary ki kiddos. Um, teachers are also using community circles to build student relationships and give students the opportunity to share how, how to use the tools. So again, I hope you're hearing about the tools at home. In July, uh, we were pleased to help kids get extra help with summer school last year. The goal was to address learning loss that resulted from the initial phases of the pandemic and also to have just some fun, right, after being locked up in our homes for so long with peers um, after, after being at home for so many months. This summer enrichment camp along with the summer program, academic program, and uh, also some programs that we did hold at the secondary level was made possible again by leveraging new monies from the governor's budget for expanded learning opportunities for all. The program offered a more academically focused program in the morning for students needing intervention due to, in, in, due to learning loss, sorry about that, in addition to the enrichment programming in the afternoon. Approximately 2,000 NVUSD kiddos participated. Um, the response was really overwhelming for us. 
And we had many districts reaching out and asking us, again, creating a California proof point, on how we develop such a comprehensive summer school program. So I want to thank the Instructional Division for their hard work around that. We, we received a lot of attention uh, by the way of PBS. Um, we were covered on their program, the series called Inside California Education. The good news is we are again offering the same free summer program and some sessions are already full. So you can hear firsthand, let's see a little bit from PBS, from the PBS show when they filled at our Willow, that I know is over there, elementary school last summer. They spent a full school year away from each other, learning and studying behind computer screens. Now these students in the Napa Valley Unified School District are thrilled to be together once again. This summer school program is helping these 2,000 students transition back to in-person education. The program combines academic learning in the morning with summer camp activities in the afternoon. Our goal is twofold. We, we, we want to see our students gaining some of the academic skills that they may have missed out on um, given the pandemic. And we want our students and families to feel much more comfortable about re-entering school in person. We've had families who've had a little bit of fear and anxiety around that in, in the past and have opted to keep their children home. So we wanted to provide a way that students and families could really come back and feel comfortable with being in person in the fall. Strong. Next row, go. Rip. Educators across California recognize the negative impacts for students who fell behind during a year of online schooling, also known as learning loss. This summer school program was designed to reverse some of that learning loss by reviewing math and literacy skills. My favorite part about summer school was basically meeting new people and making new friends and all the activities they had for us to do. Summer school helped me learn new things. After summer school was over, I was way better than when I came in. It, it started taught me some new things. It was better. I got, I got to learn the campus more, made some new friends. We're spending two weeks on um, just a review of second grade skills, so skills they should have learned this past year but maybe haven't solidified quite yet. So it's really important to have this time to give those kids a little more opportunity for review or even I'm finding some kids didn't actually learn the skills. Right. So let's take a look up here at our three digraphs that we learned today. I'm able to give immediate feedback in person. When you're on Zoom it's really hard because kids may be holding their work up and it's hard to see. I'm watching them do their writing. I can see quickly where they've made mistakes and I can intervene and redirect and give them feedback. So I think um, to have that opportunity for a little more feedback before the school year starts is going to be really valuable for them. Great. So it's great. So great to hear directly from our students, for all the parents in the room again. Uh, just a reminder that we're going to have the same level of summer programming this year. And it looks like this is going to be funding that we're going to see for the next three years from the governor's budget. So that's really exciting. Another investment we made at elementary was to our physical, and, uh, physical education and music programs. Parents will see this next year. We are so excited that we're expanding both PE and music programs so that every student, kindergarten through fifth grade, will have structured time for physical education with a PE specialist and structured time for music education with a music specialist teacher. So again, dedicated PE and music teachers will be on site at each school to provide kids with these important enrichment opportunities every week. Um, next slide. Next slide. Um, elementary, transitional kindergarten, this is also one of the, the last final updates here. We're so pleased to announce that another funding stream that's coming from the governor's budget is the expansion of our highly regarded transitional kindergarten program. So that means that four-year-olds now will be able to get educated in our community. TK offers children the opportunity to learn social skills and the academic foundational skills necessary to succeed in school. So we're very excited about that future expansion. This fall, we're going to expect to expand TK from seven to nine schools with the goal of um, expanding uh, TK ac across the district. And then um, elementary again, free breakfast and lunch. Um, I am also happy to announce 
that we'll be offering free lunch and breakfast next year. So the new breakfast program will be provided to children at the very beginning of the day um, in the classroom. We're super excited for this addition to the school day, not only to ensure kids are getting a nutritious breakfast to start their day, but also we think that this will be a big help for families, especially those in, most in need, knowing that they'll be able to be fed as they try to get up out the door every morning. And then last but not least, a lot of investments again at elementary. Um, we're so excited that uh, this year uh, we conducted an evaluation process and NVUSD has selected Discovery Science to provide a comprehensive, new comprehensive science program for our kindergarten through fifth grade. Another great use of one-time monies. So this program will offer students immersive, interactive, and creative ways to explore and learn about science the program includes hands-on engineering, activities and labs, virtual investigations, and STEM connections. We're launching again this new science curriculum in the fall of 2022, so stay tuned elementary parents. All right, moving on to middle school. We focused a lot this year on middle school, and middle school is a time to continue building those uh, academic and socio-emotional skills to prepare our students for that next uh, level of high school. This is particularly important, a particularly important and pivotal time where students are navigating complex social and emotional pressures as they enter adolescence. And here at NVUSD, we want your child to develop strong study habits, to continue to, continue to embrace learning, and to value education in general. So one way that we're doing this is through focusing on better differentiated learning. I've heard this over and over again as a need in our middle, middle schools, a critical step, step in helping all students be prepared for high school. We recognize that some students need support in certain academic areas, while others need support with more advanced work. Thanks to the middle school redesign efforts led by the instructional division, we can more readily identify these students and provide the supports that they need. We're looking forward to opportunities for advanced learning and interventions to be included in the newly structured middle school schedule and day. Another important um, aspect or element of this redesign work has been social emotional learning. In our middle school grades, we are using the second step curriculum, a modern weekly web-based system that helps students navigate, again, those complicated issues. It's underpinned by the latest research in adolescent, adolescent brain development and social psychology. Here's an example of weekly lessons that our middle school teachers are implementing in the classroom. Now, this year was special. Again, a lot of dedicated, focused time um, for uh, uh, our middle school principals. So let's just take a moment and honor the middle school representatives in the room if our principals and middle school's parents can also rise that are representing our middle schools and let's give them a big round of applause. So thank you. I survived um, two middle schoolers twice. Again, I said I have a 16 year old and an almost 21 year old. So I know middle school parents how tough those years can be, right? As they move through that initial phase of adolescence. So we wanted for the first time to really focus in on middle school. The team pictured here helped us reimagine our middle schools, come up with a vision statement, which will be leading our work and our priorities next year. Next slide. Here's the vision that they put together to provide an inclusive, equitable, responsive, restorative, and rigorous education where students have a sense of belonging and students are encouraged to discover who they are and learn to advocate and contribute within a high quality educational environment. What a tremendous aspiration. Now we have the work ahead of us of implementing that vision. So we've changed our schedules. All middle schools will have a consistent start and end time. You've got new bell schedules coming that are gonna include a weekly advisory for all the schools or a homeroom period allowing the students to build community and experience social emotional learning curriculum again that I mentioned. And schools will add flex periods for academic differentiation. Again, a focus on that differentiation in the future, whether a student needs intervention or more advanced work. In addition, as our uh, comprehensive uh, middle schools get slightly larger, it's important to build a smaller sense of learning community. 
So um, to better support our students, the three comprehensive middle schools, Silverado, Redwood, and American Canyon Middle School, will adopt a teaming approach um, in the seventh and eighth grade where students will be grouped in a cohort and share the same teachers for the entire school year. Um, this approach will allow teachers to effectively um, address and collaborate on the best ways to support students. Sixth grade will also adopt a core model, meaning all students will be taught by a team of three to four teachers. So let's take a quick moment to hear from middle school students about their experience at Redwood Middle School, which has already instituted uh, the teaming concept with great success. At Redwood, to make it easier, we split the students into teams. About half of the grade level is in each team, and they're named after colleges. Six teachers for the Hornets and six teachers for the Aggies. And you're at the beginning of the year, you're assigned classes, and you're either with the Aggie teacher, the Hornets teacher, so whatever teachers you have, you're on that team. We have like an AR point system, and if like a lot of your team gets like enough AR points, you can have a party for it, like an ice cream party or like a flex party. What's beneficial about having teams at your own school is grouping up with people you already know and it'll be easier to work with them. But what I think having a smaller group of teachers is that you're getting to know them better and you're more familiar with what they do. So if you have them like in the next grade, you know what their schedule's kind of like and how they teach. It's important to know your teachers really well because if you don't know something and you don't feel comfortable asking your teacher, then you'll be confused and you won't learn as well. I think my favorite thing about school is the teachers because I think they work really hard for their job and it's nice that we have a te teachers in general that teach us things and help us get ready for the world. Thank you, Redwood, for being that example. The teaming concept really makes it possible to create the benefits of a small school, so we're looking forward again to implementing that at all the larger comprehensives next year. We're super excited about another new offering, which is middle school athletics, an expanded athletics program. It's been over 15 years since the middle schools had a formal um, athletics program run by the district, which at the time had to be eliminated due to previous budget constraints and, and reductions. The expanded after-school athletics program uh, will be offering two sixth grade sports and seven sports for seventh and eighth graders starting in the fall of 2022. All teams will compete against all other schools in the district. It'll be an, an intra-district um, uh, league. And um, a budget has been allocated for coaches, equipment, uniforms, and transportation. So students will have busing. Um, so uh, that's really, really exciting. Um, and last, surely not least, in discussions around the middle school, next year is, a, is an exciting year. We are um, uh, launching some new programs. We're going to be welcoming students to um, the new Unidos Middle School, um, a, a language culture, uh, uh, cultural arts and language academy. It is now fully enrolled for next year, and it'll carry on the popular K-5 dual immersion program uh, by bringing now students to the middle school. Another option to, to dual language learning at the middle school. Another option for smaller learning communities is the expansion of a pilot program of uh, the TK, transitional kindergarten through eighth grade model, starting with the 2022-2023 school year. Sheer, which I know is here, will be adding an additional sixth grade class and a seventh grade class to eventually build up to that complete TK-8. And we're excited in our upcoming school year that Browns Valley, which I know is here to my right, will begin the transition to becoming a TK-8 model as well by adding two sixth grade classes next year. This does give families looking for a smaller school experience another option to consider here in the Napa Valley Unified School District. All right, high school. Remember those Napa high school choir singers, those kids? <laughs> Uh, sort of the, the culmination, right? The culmination of, of K, TK-12. So as you all know, the goal of high school is that we have our students leaving our system college and career ready. With the right systems and people in place, high schools can take a big step forward when it comes to supporting and transforming the lives of our students. Looking at the past year at the high school level, we focused on maintaining as much normalcy as possible in addition to keeping uh, academic standards in place, because we know high school can be high stakes, right? One hi highlight was the ability to keep sports going, as well as our amazing visual and performing arts programs, like what you saw today, 
kicking off today's event, despite the pandemic and despite financial hardship. Despite all of the budgetary constraints we've been dealing with, our jazz, our marching bands, our choir, our theater and drama groups were all able to be together, bringing their wonderful talent for the joy of their audiences. In addition, um, so many of our high school students here in NVUSD, a significant proportion of them participate in athletics, and we offer a multitude of sports. Just a fun fact, um, our newest, one of our newest sports, lacrosse, started about two years ago, the pandemic hit, but we're excited to report that this year the girls' lacrosse teams at Vintage and Napa recruited enough players to have a lacrosse big game um, in Memorial Stadium. Stadium, and it was also great to ha um, add this year men's volleyball at American Canyon High School. Um, so it was wonderful to be able to keep our children actively and physically engaged during this very difficult time. Also during this difficult time, again, trying to keep our high school environment no as normal as possible for our kids as they prepare for that next step in the world. As with years past, we continue to offer free on-site SAT and PSAT testing at all of our high schools, which many, many kids took advantage of. And I want to thank my high school administrative teams. That was something very, very difficult to coordinate um, during the global pandemic. And it was because of their leadership, we continue to implement PSAT and SAT days here in the district when, and our partnership with the College Board when many districts had it fall off. So thank you. Um, let's take a moment to honor those high school leaders that we have in the room and our high school parent leaders in the room. Stand up. Give them a round of applause. We know that our high school leaders and our high school parents are all marching towards that goal that comes that senior year, which is high school graduation. And here we can see some recent grads who are now alumni of NVUSD. And as a district, we should be proud of our graduation rates. Um, for one, since 2019, our high school graduation rate has been over 90% of our seniors graduating. And number two, um, during the pandemic, that number did not fall. It actually increased by a small percentage. By way of comparison, I think it's important for the community to know that the, gra the average graduation rate across California has, um, in public high schools is about 87%, and so we have been exceeding that. But I don't want to just talk to you about how great our graduates are. Let's hear from some of our American Canyon um, high school students who are approaching the big milestones themselves in just a few weeks and already have big plans for the future. Um, I believe the best class that really prepared me for this transition to college right now, um, I would say my AVID class. AVID prepares you for college and high school, and it helps you pick up skills and techniques that are very essential for life. I got in the class my freshman year, I stayed it for all four years, and our assignments were researching about college, so like our and researching about our lives, and researching about what we liked, and field trips to different colleges that you know we were able to go to before the pandemic, and able to see what we really enjoyed and how we would be able to turn that into a future career. I have this counselor, her name is Fabiola Alvarez, and she works with the 10,000 Degrees Scholarships, and she's been really helpful. Every Wednesday she helps me um, apply and get emails sent and everything done so that I am prepared to attend the community college. So I took the PSAT and the SAT on campus, and actually during COVID it was really hard to find places to take the SAT because everything was closed down. So when the school announced that they were going to um, host the SATs here, it was very helpful, especially because I was searching like at different schools, different locations, different cities. I plan to go to NBC and then do a two-year transfer. After I graduate high school, I plan to attend the community college here in Napa and see where that leads me. I plan to go to Phoenix, Arizona and to a school called GCU. Um, I plan to get my degree in nursing. Overall, our school and district has a really good support system and I wish I would have utilized it a little more, but with what I did utilize, I am very grateful for how they have set me up. After I graduate in June, I plan to go to um, University of the Pacific and major in biomedical engineering and minor in mathematics. 
I think my favorite thing about the school, um, I like the culture and all that and the environment, but my favorite thing is just like the people. I feel like I've had like some of the best teachers. Like I have people that actually kind of care like about me, not just as like, a student, but like they actually genuinely care about like where I'm gonna go in life, what I'm gonna do, and they believe in me. Excellent. So thank you again to our high school administrative teams, our high school teachers and guidance counselors that do tremendous work in getting our kids to this important, these important milestones. Um, what's to come in high school, really quickly? As we return to a full in-person instruction this year, teachers have been excited to engage students with new science curriculum as well, especially with hands-on lab components. This year was sort of a disrupted year because of the persisting pandemic and the variants, but we look forward to a deeper implementation of that new science curriculum um, next year, praying for a normal year. Um, also, we uh, are, have made additions to um, our high school pathway, math pathway. New and ex it's a new and expanded math acceleration pathway where there'll be some additional courses and options for students, like looking at data science and statistics and probability. We're also returning to the Summer College Readiness Math Academy to support the important transition from uh, middle school when it comes to math um, to high school to make sure that we're addressing those prerequisite skills for the more advanced math that students, um, that students come up against in, in high school. Also, high school world languages, just so you know, uh, that our world language teams are, are using new curriculum in French, Spanish, and also in the courses that are Spanish for heritage speakers. Again, all of these new uh, curricular resources are a phenomenal investments with that one-time money that we're getting from the governor. The team is redesigning uh, the Spanish pathways as we prepare for the opening of Unidos Middle School, which will allow more students um, to access uh, a higher level of academic Spanish and um, this will lead them to the path of the uh, very distinguished seal of biliteracy that can go on the student's transcript if they are interested. Another important component, um, lots of expansions that you'll see next year is around high school career explanation, not explanation, exploration. At NVUSC, our mission is lifelong learning. So whether that is college or next steps in career, our graduates are being prepared to, for their future by having lots of exposure opportunities to career options. So it's um, been a pleasure to update you on the state of our district. Finally, uh, just a quick note about our strategic plan that has served as sort of our you know, star, North Star and guide over the course of the last uh, four years. One of the first things I did do when I got here was to develop a strategic plan in partnership and collaboration with our governance team, the school board, and it has guided our priorities and it is moving the needle on our vision. I hope today generated lots of evidence of that for you. Again, essentially the strategic plan serves as our organization's North Star. This three-year plan was a critical framework in guiding us, and although we didn't know it at the time, it was our lifeboat when we as a district needed to create priorities when a global pandemic hit. It was great to be able to lean into a strategic plan during a global pandemic, as opposed to putting it aside on a shelf. We will be sending out a detailed report of the accomplishments over the course of the next few weeks um, or few months. And moving forward, we will adjust these goals for the next years ahead, continuing to have that guide. Now, I want to close today with some recognitions. I know I just want the community to know our parents um, in the room and the community that might be joining us virtually. None of this kind of work in California public schools uh, can be accomplished without there being a strong governance team leading the district, being willing to stay student focused, being willing to make courageous um, decisions. And it's a really tough time in California and really across the country to be a school board trustee. So I want to just start out by thanking um, the Napa Valley Unified School District Board of Education. I feel incredibly supported by them as the superintendent. They're here today, so I just want to take a moment to recognize them. They have been a big part of us being able to advance this work. So joining us today is almost the whole governance team, um, not quite all of them, but most of them. We have President Robin Jenkins here today, <laughs> Vice President David Gracia, <laughs> Trustee Lisa Chu, <laughs> Trustee Jason Dooley, and Trustee Eve Reiser. 
Thank you for your leadership at a very, very difficult, uh, during a very difficult time. I also just want to thank all of you for joining me today. This has felt so special. Um, it, it, I appreciate you embarking on the journey, sticking with it and listening as I talk to you about the work of the last four years and what's ahead. Hopefully you feel like you know a little bit more about how and why we stabilize the district financially. Hopefully you feel like you know more about how we survive the global pandemic as an educational system and community. And most importantly, I hope you feel confident. I hope you feel confident about the better future that we are building for our students through our strategic investments and efforts. I want to thank a lot of special people in the room. Um, so I want to thank the, again, I, I recognized our union leadership, another critical partner. We have NVEA and NAPS and CSEA, if they could please stand, and we could give our union partners a big hand for their work. I want to thank um, Nosh. Um, the food today was provided by our own meal program, right? So we have this incredible um, program. Hopefully you found it tasty and healthy. It's what your you know, children have access to, to, to eat every day. So I want to thank them for providing today's food. And I also want to thank many of the special guests that are here today. So we have, um, of course, Dr. Barbara Nemko, who is our county superintendent of schools. So thank you for being here, Dr. Nemko, and for all of your support. We're working hard to continue to uh, nurture our critical partnership for our kids with the Napa Valley College. And it's so great to have Holly Dawson here from NVC. I want to thank uh, Molly Radigan, who's here uh, representing the city of Napa. Uh, lots of uh, incredible work and partnership with the city of Napa. And I think I heard, did Scott Sedgley make it? Is he here? Hey, Scott. OK. So thank you so much, Scott, for being here um, as well. I also just want to recognize my executive cabinet. So we have Assistant Superintendent Mike Pearson. Where are you, Mike? Is he not in the room? There he is. <laughs> Operational Services. Assistant Superintendent Rob Manguala, Business Services. Assistant Superintendent Dana Page, Human Resources. Assistant Superintendent Pat Andrew Jennings from the uh, leading the Instructional Services Division. And our full cabinet, our district leadership team, our directors and our assistant directors, if they can rise, who are a fierce, fierce force in the implementation of all this work. And if we could just do one last round of recognition, you know as parents that our school system is only as effective as our school site principals. Principals are so key. So if our principals can rise. <laughs> for the principals, thank you for running our buildings. If I missed anyone, uh, my apologies. Parents in the room, thank you. I hope we've recognized you enough. So again, thank you for coming. I hope, I look forward to being able to do these regularly now in person. Um, I want to remind you um, and thank the Napa Valley Education Foundation. Is Jennifer Stewart here? Stewart in the room? Is she here? She may have had to leave. Oh, she had to leave. Okay. Um, they um, uh, provided some donations to sponsor to today's event. You see your nice, cute water bottle. Um, please don't forget to leave with that, all right? We do not want to have a bunch of water bottles left behind. So um, before we close today, I want to just, um, we wanted to play with the fundamental question of why we do this work. And we asked our kids, what do you love most about your school? So let's end today's State of the District 2022 with the voice of our amazing NVUSD students. The thing I like most about Northwood is art. The thing I like about Northwood is that people are nice. I love candy notes because people are kind. I like my school because my school is bilingual and offers a good education and a better understanding of other cultures. What I like best about the school is the classes and the students. One thing we love about our school is that we learn English y español. The thing about Valley Oak is that it gives second chances to people like me. My favorite thing about American Canyon High School is the diversity and how students share and embrace their cultures on campus. I like Willow because we can do a lot of stuff. We can have recess and stuff. We can um, do math. I like math and 
You can do a lot of activities. The thing I like most about Northwood is the kind teachers and the amazing assemblies. I like Silverado because it's super inclusive. I like that it's able to, easy to make friends. What I love about this school is that I get inspired a lot by the teachers who go here. I like this school because all the volunteers that go to this school make everything so fun. And this school is just fun in general and I love it. I like school because it's a very kind place and I like when we do art projects here. What I love about American Canyon Middle School is that all the staff and students are very loving and kind here. I love Canyon Oaks because we're the home of the Mighty Oaks. I like most about Napa High is our inclusiveness and being a leadership student. It's nice because we know about the rallies and everything going on, so we always like to bring people together. What I love most about Napa High is our teachers. What I love most about Napa High is our sports programs. My favorite thing about Redwood is the activities we do in our electives, like lottery and leadership and video production. What I like most about Napa Junction is the grass and that everybody here is nice and that, um, and that it's um, really big. I my school because it lets me express my culture. For example, we celebrate Dia de Nino and it is widely celebrated in Mexico and it makes me feel honored. All right. Have a beautiful summer with your children and thank you so much for being here. Go NBUSC.